I'm here to talk a little bit about a modern argument for jobs and freedom. So how many of you know jobs and freedom? Where is that most clearly connoted throughout uh, the American history? Okay. So, um, uh, so the first time we really heard those words juxtaposed in a big way was in the March on Washington. So um, people know about the March on Washington. It was in August 1963. Um, but what we, um, we often forget is, is that it was called the March on Washington colon for jobs and freedom. And so I think that's a really interesting piece. When I was, uh, a I, I taught um, honor students last year, uh, and um, right after the election, I said, there's a guy leading a march in Washington, and he says to us, hey, spray paint sign, two words on a sign, and we're going to lead a march. We're going to spray paint jobs and freedom. Who's leading that march? And every member of my class, almost without exception, said Donald Trump. And that blew my mind because I grew up uh, a student of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, a big fan of this march in particular, and understanding that jobs were inextricably linked to freedom. But when I say freedom, it may mean freedom in a way that's different than the way that you think about freedom. Freedom in the way that we commonly talk about it now is freedom from government interference, freedom in the libertarian sense of freedom. I don't want to go down that sort of philosophical rabbit hole, but what I mean by freedom and what I think Dr. King meant by freedom is freedom from domination. Freedom to be the fullest version of yourself. Freedom to belong and contribute in the society in which you live. And so what he fought for was equality, uh, but he also fought, fought for the dignity that came with work. And so what we're talking about now and what um, I thought it might be useful to give just a little bit of sort of philosophical context about how we got here. Um, so here's a quick agenda. I think it's useful because I was a grad student not that long ago, and so I like to tell people, I like to, ev at every turn when I get a chance, I try to um, tell grad students that anybody who says that their pathway was linear and they knew exactly what they were going to do is probably um, full of BS, um, or, or you know, maybe they, they really were that insightful. But I, my, my path was anything but linear. Uh, so I, I like to talk a little bit about that just in case you yourself are floundering um, like I was probably not that long ago. And then sort of how we came through this, what my research uh, says, and then how we, how we ended up at Innovate Birmingham. And I'd also like to quickly recognize my colleague who uh, definitely helps us make, uh, me make a better version of myself and, and make Innovate Birmingham happen, Serena Martinez, who's here with us. She's a Venture for America fellow, one of 17 who came to, uh, to Birmingham this year. Um, so uh, this, student, th this student is clearly not struggling that much. Uh, struggling student needs Prada. Sometimes as a graduate student, I think um, we have this sort of, uh, you know, first world, you know, hashtag first world problem all over us, right? We're soaked in the opportunity to learn, to listen, and to be around really smart people, to spend several hours um, really undisturbed thinking through what we want to study and why we want to study it. But sometimes that can actually be really hard. It's almost like you're surrounded by insurmountable opportunity, right? And so I was one of these students who was um, not asking for Prada, but was asking for direction. And, and I struggled pretty, pretty hard. And um, so what happened um, was that uh, I was at Oxford. And I don't know if you've been to Oxford ever, but England's not known for its sunshine. Um, so uh, literally a couple of years ago, the, during the entire month of November, the city of Oxford saw 30 hours of sunshine the entire month, right? So it's already pretty grim. Um, we're all walking around with this sort of major chip on our shoulders. And um, so our dean of social and behavioral sciences uh, came up with an idea that backfired royally. Um, and she said, what I'm going to do is bring all the social and behavioral science students who are studying graduate, student, graduate students here together and we are going to do an acronym challenge. So you're going to, the, the description was, describe the process of being a graduate student using the acronym of DPhil. DPhil is just um, the, the posh way of saying PhD. Um, don't tell them I said that. But it is, um, it is just a doctorate of philosophy. So we all got together and we clustered up in our groups with strangers to talk about what the DPhil process meant to us. And so here's how that backfired. The first one was, a dreadful, dreadful process hindering an inspired life. Um, that was just the beginning. Uh, 
damaged people hobnobbing in Latin. This is perhaps, perhaps my favorite, uh, particularly uh, acute for me. One of my best friends, still one of my best friends, was, was great at Latin, had a proclivity to speak in Latin after he'd had a few pints at the pub. And one night after we had had several pints on the pub, um, and any bike ride home would have been wobbly, but particularly wobbly on a cobblestone street. He was pulled over by a police officer, and he responded only in Latin. And at some point, the police officer said, if you do not speak to me in English, I'm going to arrest you. And he said, oh, you fool, don't you know I'm speaking to you in the very foundation of it. Um, he was arrested. Uh, so <laughs> damaged people hobnobbing in Latin. Um, dampened poor hiding in libraries. Uh, pretty accurate for most of my experience. Desperate people habituating in libations. Um, and do please help, I'm lonely. <laughs> this one was my favorite. I think it won the prize. At any rate, what it said to me then and what it reaffirmed to me and what I hope it may do to some of you is that graduate work is hard. It's really hard because to this point in your educational career, you've been taught to think through your education to find answers. In graduate school is the first time someone looks at you and says, you're not here to find answers, you're here to identify questions. And guess what, that second part's a lot harder. And so sometimes a lot of us wrestle with what questions we need to ask, why we need to ask them, where are we going and why. And that's a really, really big um, problem because I don't think we communicate that there's a culture of that uncertainty. There's a culture, frankly, of that inferiority, what it means to, to move into that space. So um, I struggled really hard. My first six months, I went after this question. I, cha I chased a rabbit trail. I was interested in for-profit colleges, rent-seeking economies and for-profit colleges. And um, I called about 100 for-profit colleges and couldn't get data. So my first six months were pretty much a wash of my DPhil career. And um, so I was really struggling. And I went to, um, I had this fantastic supervisor. I had two really, really splendid supervisors, but one of them, name is Nigel Bowles. He is like the quintessential UK academic, you know, elbow patches in the works. Um, and he said to me, he said, Josh, I want you to meet me at the Ashmolean Museum. We're going to meet at this particular staircase. We're going to talk about this painting. And this painting is by Paolo Uccello. Um, uh, so Paolo Uccello painted this in the 15th century in Spain. And so I walked up and I saw Nigel and he was just looking directly at the portrait. And uh, me being me, the first thing I did was, hello. Uh, and he said, shh, just focus. Um, which someone could always say to me because that's, uh, that's still a problem I have. Um, but anyway, he asked me a question. He said, what is, wh what is this painting about? And I said, well, you know, there's people on horses. There's people, um, you know, um, it looks like they have spears. And it was like the hunt, right? It's a hunt. And he said, but where is the energy? You know, what do you see going on? And I talked to him about the vivid colors, the red and the panels and um, the symmetry of the trees. And he said, oh, that's fine. But where's the energy? So where is the energy? Where? The center, right? But what particularly, what, what can you see in the center? Do you, but what, like what's in the dead center? Do you see a deer? It's just black. But all the energy is emanating from this what? The central focal point, right? This very central focal point. That's your research question, he said. Sometimes you don't see it, sometimes you don't know it, but you know that that's the emanating source for all of your quests, for all of your curiosity. All this other stuff can be window dressing, right? This is, if this is a footnote, that's what we're going for. That's the substance of what you're talking about. And so um, I figured out that I didn't have a substance in the center of my voice. I figured out that I was really good at talking about paneling and symmetry, but I had no idea what I was really passionate about. So I went to him and I said, I don't know what I want to study. I, and if, I, if I'm going to commit three to four years to this, I want it to matter, not just to me, but to other people. And at the time, we passed a law in uh, the United States, a, little, a couple of years prior to that, uh, called the Affordable Care Act. And I read this story about a woman in Kentucky who had driven a thousand miles to sign people up for the Affordable Care Act. I was so inspired by her. And I was looking at her life in comparison to my own, saying I was doing nothing except for spending too much time hobnobbing in Latin with my friends in pints at the pub. And I wanted to do something that mattered, and I didn't know what I wanted to do as a graduate student. And so my supervisor said, go do what you want to do. Go home for this Thanksgiving and, um, and, and think through what it means to, to, 
to maybe engage in this way, because that's clearly what you want to do. What was the Affordable Care Act? Um, basically, and despite your politics, it, it had three sort of major intentions, right? One is to broaden access, increase the number of people who had health care access. Two was the, to improve the quality of care, the quality of health outcomes. And three was to de decrease, co decrease costs both for individuals and for the nation as a whole, right? And so those were kind of the three pieces. What we wanted to do was really um, help out in navigating those core components. So what we came up with was um, Bama covered. Um, I, my wife could tell you I never set out to start a nonprofit. I came back home with one of my good friends to sort of think through um, how I could be a help as a navigator. But when we came here and started speaking to a lot of people who are doing fantastic work, some in our community, in Roll Alabama, AIDS Alabama, uh, the Arise Citizens Policy Institute, um, and a number of other folks across the state, they gave us two words. They said, one, we're overwhelmed. So we, we, there, there's, a, there's a huge miscommunication about what's happening. And two is we don't, have enough, um, we, don't, we don't have enough people who can go out and just deliver this message in an unbiased, objective way. So what we wanted to do is say, who do people trust in their communities? We can name a, a few of those folks. But to me, one of the most untapped, piece, um, untapped uh, sources of potential and talent in our country is college students. Because so many people listen to college students, and so many times people tell college students, you know, you, you're just learning for these next four years, and then you can go add value. That's not true. College students, uh, despite what some of them may think, have a lot of time on their hands, right? And at the end of the day, what's true is that they're, they're capable learners. They're capable of getting out in the community, and they're capable of having conversations in an objective, clear way. So we went to campuses all over across the state, 14 four-year college campuses, and one of the things I'm most proud about is 31 two-year college campuses. We had graduate students, we had law students, we had medical students all volunteer with us because they found this important. They all came from every side of the political spectrum, every side of the political spectrum. They all came to say one question to families. They would say, there's a lot of changes happening in the healthcare landscape. Do you know how those changes are affecting you and your family? That was it. And it turns out that depoliticizes a whole lot of things. So we created about 100,000 conversations in four months. And our, our, our work was recognized by the New York Times. We ended up, we were instrumental in, in um, signing up about 98,000 young people, um, or not all young people, 98,000 people in the state of Alabama, disproportionate number of whom were young. In fact, Alabama had the third highest per capita percentage of young people behind New York and California. So we got a letter from Kathleen Sebelius, and people said, oh, this is really great. And it was really fun, but except there was one major piece that um, really kept me up at night. And this, going back to my research part earlier, became what was my, my darkness in the forest, if you will. So how many of you know about the Medicaid coverage gap? Raise your hand. Good, you're all gonna be experts in about five seconds. All right, so first we passed the Affordable Care Act. Y'all see uh, the little Mr. President over there on the left. Um, so we passed the Affordable Care Act in 2010, right? And then what happened is it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in 2012 that most of the law was held intact except for one piece, which was Medicaid expansion. States could not be mandated to expand their Medicaid eligibility levels. We can change Medicaid in a couple of different ways as a state. One is eligibility levels, right? And we're going to talk about that, but you should know that you now, wherever you're from, are living in the state with the lowest threshold for a single parent. The lowest threshold for a single parent. If you make more than $3,221 as a single mom, you are too rich for Medicaid in the state of Alabama. Too rich. That same woman, that same single mom, could move to Minnesota and she could make $38,000 and she would still qualify for Medicaid. So we have this massive differential in our, in our country. And, and one of the things that I'm really passionate about is the fact that we actually have two different healthcare systems in our country as a result of it. One for red states and one for blue states. But that fault line is here on Medicaid expansion. So some states expanded and some did not. This was at the time that we did this. These were the non-expansion states. Now several states since then have expanded. But this was the fault line. Um, what you can't see here is that there were an estimated 300 in a study that came out of actually the School of Public Health. Uh, David Becker wrote it um, with uh, Michael Morrissey. 332,000 Alabamians fell into what's called the coverage gap. So these are people for whom, if they had moved to another state, they would have gotten health care, 
right? But they were, and they couldn't, they weren't quite, they didn't quite make enough to, to get a, a subsidy. So there's, I talked about the three kind of prongs of this. One of the ways to expand access was, and lower costs, was to do tax credits. So healthcare.gov, some of you probably remember that. Healthcare.gov basically is a online marketplace to help people navigate where they are on this, on the spectrum. People who make 250% and less, uh, or 250% to 133% of the federal poverty line qualified for um, a, an advanced sharing subsidy, and the rest qualified for a tax credit up to 400% of the federal poverty line. So this part was all still intact in Alabama. So those 98,000 people we helped sign up, they were from 133% of the poverty line this way. But is that where all the uninsured people live? No, right? This was a gap. In some states, Medicaid covered it, or Medicaid was covered, but in many other states, it was not. Alabama was one of those states. So we had, um, so why, why did I develop this research question? I'll tell you in, in a story, because it's really important to me. So um, the last day of enrollment, we call it our Alamo of enrollment. We had uh, about 40 students at Railroad Park. And it was a Sunday, we had a band playing, Congresswoman Sewell came out, Mayor Bell came out. We were talking about the importance of it. We had radio shows, we were in churches that morning. We had about 500 people come out to speak with us. There were news stations there. And people came up to us and they said, you must be so excited, you had a great turnout. But I went home at, that night and something gnawed at me for a long time. The, the bottom line was that about, we could only help about one in three people, right? Because they fell into that coverage gap. And there was a guy who was my age. He had done everything right. He had um, gone to school, got a construction job, found out he was going to be a dad, decided to cut back his, his, his hours on his construction job, and then um, become, uh, become a welder. So he was going back to school. So he cut back his hours, so he's making less money, and he's, he's, now he's got this child. So he moved from being here to here based on the fact that he was making a forward-looking decision for him and his family to upskill himself so he could make more money. Yet our law penalized him for it. So here I am trying to explain it to this guy, and it's on a Sunday afternoon, it's March, and I'm, I'm saying, you know what, this is, it doesn't seem fair to me. At some level, you need to go protest, right? You need to vote. And he says to me, he says, I'll never forget it, he just folded up his W-2 form, and he said, you know, I really appreciate your help today, but that's just not what I do. And I was like, how? This is such an important issue, right? And he said, I don't vote. And she probably won't either, looking at his little, little girl. And that struck me as something that was so fundamentally different than the way I felt about my role in society. And I, I was struck by the fact that if there were 332,000 people in that gap, and one person, one candidate, favored expanding it to cover those folks, and the other candidate was against it, if those 332,000 people voted, all of whom were voting aged, what would happen? Right? Potentially, you could see a flip in the election and maybe a change in the law. So I was really interested in this intersection of people. How does the economics of health care access change the way people think about voting and belonging in their, really in their country? So here was my research question. 332,000 voter age citizens were eligible for Medicaid under expansion. This was the big piece um, that I think I found right away when I realized I was a little bit out of my depth. Somebody read that second bullet point. One third Only one third were what? <laughs> registered to vote. So out of that 332,000, 104,000 of them were registered to vote. Why is that? There's a lot of reasons why that is. Part of it is we're more mobile than we've ever been, right? So people move a lot and they don't necessarily um, uh, uh, re-register. And we put that requirement on the individual in the United States, which some studies account for about nine to 10 percent of voter, voter registration loss. Um, and uh, the other piece is that low-income people move a lot more, right? That's real. The other piece of this is that we have this thing called in, in, in the state of Alabama called felon disenfranchisement. At the time, there's been some clarity on it since, but at the time we had this law called moral turpitude. If you committed a crime of, quote, moral turpitude, and if you have to look up what turpitude means, you're not at a boat of your own because that was written back in the 1900s, right? But the bottom line is we didn't define what turpitude meant, right? And so you had all these young people who uh, may have committed a crime that may or may not have been of turpitude, and so there was this huge gray space on who could re-register. We estimated it was at 220,000 people who were in limbo on their voter registration status just because of their prior convictions. 
So you have this huge block of people for whom a big law would give them access. Talking, we're talking about saving people $4,600 on average annually, which makes a huge difference probably to a lot of us in this room, but certainly to lower income families. But here's the deal. So we had one candidate who was for expansion, right? Um, his name was Parker Griffith. He was running for the, uh, the gubernatorial race in 2014 for the Democratic Party. And there was one candidate who was against it. Um, our former governor, uh, Robert Bentley, he was against expansion, right? And he, had, he, had, he was one of the governors who voted against it. So I was really interested in not only could we communicate this to people and would they change their mind and vote, but how would they change their mind? What message was most influential? Would they be governed by something that, that was considered self-interest or community interest? Um, so we did this question, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, the bottom line is, is we wanted to know if low-income citizens knew they were members of a defined policy target population, would they mobilize the vote in their own interest? Um, so we ran a big, a big experiment. So I have to say this again to our, my graduate students, particularly our, our doctoral students in the room. There's so much that comes into your, um, your orbit when you're a graduate student. One of them is that you usually adopt the methods of the people who are closest to you. That's not necessarily a good idea, right? You have to pick methods that not just suit your study, but suit you. If you're gonna be miserable running regressions all day long, go talk to people and do some more qualitative work. If you're gonna be miserable talking to people, learn how to do a bunch of different re regressions. For me, I loved experimentation. I'm just, that's just who I was. And I really wanted to learn experimental social science. I really wanted to learn how to do a randomized control trial. That was something that I wanted to be true of my skill set by the time I left. So we designed a statewide randomized control experiment that had um, several folks. And we, we used um, uh, Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile as the, the target cities for that. And we built out a campaign apparatus. And we knocked on several doors, about 8,000 doors over the course of two weeks to talk to people who we had micro-targeted who were in the Medicaid gap. I can talk to you more about that, but I don't want to dwell on the, the study for too long. Um, just remember what I say that. So use your own experiment, experimental methods or your own methods that suit you. So we did a survey experiment, a field experiment, and then we did interviews. Interviews are really important to me, right? Um, I, I, I could stand here and hold forth on why I think they're important um, from an academic perspective, but in a nutshell, if I had not done in interviews, I wouldn't have come away with the findings that I came away with. Um, you know, as it turns out, talking to the people who actually are benefited or who are actually affected makes a difference, um, not just running numbers. Um, so, so randomized field experiments, this is experimental work versus ob observational work. Um, you know, essentially, I, I wanted to uncover a causal theory. What you know, is X driving Y, right? More often than not, you hear that X is not driving Y, right? It's, it's, um, so this is randomization. We had three scripts. So people could hear that they were in, if I was, if I was knocking on your door and saying, hey, you're, you're eligible for Medicaid, um, uh, you know, you could save on access, uh, on average, $4,600 a year. Uh, you could get access to the top doctors, nurse practitioners, and your out-of-pocket medical expenses would be covered. That would be an example of something that you hear and go, oh, that's in my self-interest, my pocketbook interest. If I knock on your door and say, hey, you're, el you're eligible for Medicaid too, it looks like. Um, if, if Medicaid's expanded, it would save um, the state about $1.8 billion a year, create 30,000 jobs, and uh, keep uh, hospitals open across the state of Alabama. That would be a social, social script, like a sociotropic interest, a community interest, and then we had a combination of both. And then, of course, there's the control group because we want to see how not being knocked on affected people. So here was our targets. Um, these were the number of people that we, that we knocked on in each place. Um, I can go into how we did that, but that's probably not your real interest. Uh, we also had about 100 volunteers knock on those doors. Um, and I said 8,000, 5,000 doors. 8,000 were in the final sample. Um, so here's our outcome variables. What we wanted to see was, how are you going to vote? Did you understand Medicaid expansion and were you for it? Um, did you know which candidates were for it and which were against it? Um, what were the individual benefits? Could you articulate the individual benefits of expansion? What were the social benefits of expansion? And then number six is really important. Did they recall talking to someone at their door? So the bottom line of this slide is people remember being contacted. Statistically significant, people who were knocked on their door, they, they remembered the conversation. But here's the problem. They may have remembered it. In fact, we demonstrate that they knew more about it. So they actually knew more about um, 
Medicaid than the control group. They knew about how it affected them personally and how it affected their community. But they didn't do what? Because turnout is my main outcome variable, right? That's what I was looking for. Turnout and percentage. It's pretty flat. There was a statistically significant difference with the self-interest script. People were more likely to vote. But by and large, we didn't, vote, we didn't bump voter turnout that much. Right? So despite the fact that we knocked on the door, despite the fact that we told them what the issue was about, how much money they could potentially save, who, which candidate it was for, it, which one was against it, we didn't move voter turnout all that much. Why? So um, again, this is where the interviews um, came, came uh, forward. This is you know, sort of the way we do interviews now. I use constructive, constructive as grounded theory. I'm sure there are people in the room who disagree with that. But for me, it enabled us to assemble an image of this voter, right? The non-voter in particular. We have a ton of data on voters. Don't have so much data on non-voters. Even though 41% of people turned out, that means 60% in that in size didn't turn out to vote. An election that directly affected their material interests. So what, would, what did we find? Uh, entrenched disengagement among policy targets. I was, I was totally flabbergasted by this. I thought, it, 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 my wife can tell you, I thought we were going to run this campaign and everybody we talked to, they were going to vote, we we're going to turn things around, we we're going to be able to move the election, the policy was going to create, you know, people were going to be um, engaged and active citizens and we were going to be able to get people health care access. It's just not what happened. You, it turns out a two minute conversation with a stranger doesn't actually move you that far, right? Um, legal and procedural hurdles, hurdles to voting, this is real. I, I don't have enough time to spend a whole lot of time on it, but there's a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of procedural vo voting rules in our state. Right? We don't do early voting. That's a big deal. If you have a disability, it's hard to get to the polls on, on election day. There's a lot of traffic. Transportation can be um, a, a little bit off. Um, that's a big deal. We don't do early voting. There's a whole lot of other things that we can talk about, but that's one piece. The second, and this is a really big one, this is a lack of political efficacy. What do I mean by efficacy? I mean, do I think that my vote matters? That, that's the answer to that question. A lot of the folks that we dealt with they had watched and they understood what Medicaid meant to them, right? There's a quote that I remember uh, by a, a woman who um, was, a, was a single mom who said, they'll take care of my kids and they'll take care of my mom, but I'm the one who falls in the cracks. So she was saying, Medicaid takes care of my kids. That's great. Alabama has a great Medicaid program, um, children's health and in insurance program. Um, and then Medicare took care of her mom, but she was in the cracks, right? She knew that... The parameters of, of public policy had been drawn to exclude her. And she felt that. She internalized that as saying, my life doesn't matter right now. Not to government. So why should I be engaged? So the third piece is policy targets were conditioned to thinking outside that political system. That is a really, really important piece of, of the puzzle. And my argument, my, my argument to political scientists is that this is different, right? So if I'd run the same campaign in California, would I have gotten the same results? Probably not. Right? Medicaid's got a wider policy spectrum. Their welfare laws are very different. And these areas, it's called devolution, things that are devolved to the states. Right? We've been doing that since Lincoln. Right? Lincoln made slavery open to, the slavery decision before him was open to different states. Right? We have been devolving um, deci major decisions to states for a very long time. And somehow we have it, we've, mono we, we've made the United States a monolith, talking about our health care system. Even when we look at healthcare outcomes in this state, we see major differentials, right? In some counties in our state, the infant mortality rate is comparable to Tanzania. That's real. The HIV infection rate is comparable to Rwanda. That's, that's, that's in our state. That's a couple miles from here, a couple hundred miles from here. So what, what, I, what I would encourage you to do and what I think graduate school does for you is to disaggregate these numbers because so, so, so many times we're tempted to kind of package it all together. But what's, what's true is that policy targets are different in different states, and that's how we have to think. Um, so research conclusions, we don't really need to get into those. Here was, there's the, these are the research conclusions that I drew, right, the ones that I wrote about. Spent 297, of a great cure, 297 pages of a great cure to insomnia writing about it, right? You can read it if you'd like. But the bottom line is this. I took away from this a couple of things. One is that healthcare outcomes are absolutely influenced by healthcare access, right? And what do I mean by access? I mean the ability to access top doctors, nurse practitioners, which is a prerequisite often means what? Health insurance. I have to have some form of health insurance, right? Now, 
do I get to engage in preventative health and do health screenings if I don't have health insurance? No. I once talked to a young college student and God bless her, I, I, she said I'm against, I'm against the Affordable Care Act. I said, why? She said it violates people's relationships with their, their doctor. I said, which people? She said, everybody. I said, not everybody has a doctor to have a relationship with. She couldn't believe that. But for 46 million Americans, that was the truth. For 615,000 Alabamians, that is the truth. They did not have a doctor with whom to have a relationship. Right? That is a big step. And so we start thinking about how does, we talk, we talk about outcomes a ton. We talk about zip code outcomes. We talk about um, social determinants of health. One of the most basic ones is health insurance. Do I have health insurance? And what I find is that health insurance isn't just a prerequisite to healthcare access and outcomes. It's also a prerequisite to feeling like you may belong. So what's the number one way to get health insurance in the United States? Through your employer. 47% of Americans are insured through their employer or their employer spouse, right? So that meant that employment in the United States is fundamental to, in my view, health care insurance, health insurance, and health access, and health outcomes. And data bears that out, right? Right now we know that if you're in the bottom five, percent, bottom five quartile uh, or, or quintile of the, the income distribution, you are five times more likely to report unhealthy outcomes than those in the top quintile. That's not just correlation, right? There's a lot bound up in that. It means that that top quintile often has jobs, often has access to, to doctors and preventative medicine, and that's why they can live, they can live, literally live longer, right? This is a serious issue. We're talking about some studies that report as much as, um, you know, 30 and 40 years of, of life expectations in the same city, in the same city. That's, I mean, that's an absurd statistic. And we know that it, it has a racial component, it has an it has a, uh, economic component, but the bottom line is that underlying all of this in the United States, as of right now in 2017, and certainly as of 2014 when I was talking about it then, we don't look like we have a, we, it, it, healthcare for all isn't, isn't on the horizon. It just, it just, it's just not there. The political will is not there right now, and it doesn't seem to me that we're gonna make a whole lot of changes on that. So I, as a idealist who was very disappointed in this fact, decided that if I really wanted to change healthcare outcomes, if I really wanted to impact, impact healthcare output in the way that people thought about themselves, I should focus on that, that main vector, right, which is employment. So um, this is kind of how we're, I just kind of talked through this, but basically um, access and outcomes are, are inextricably linked. I know you've already studied that but it's really important to understand that access is also linked to health insurance and the fact that not everyone has it is a, is a big deal. Um, so here we are, again, I said 47%, I'm off, 48%. So um, this market in, is, is what they were trying to grow through healthcare.gov, right, trying to chip away at that 15% by growing this piece. Um, again, <coughs> Medicaid makes up a, a very sizable um, uh, chunk of the population that's covered by health insurance in, in our state. Um, but again, that 15%, here's the deal. If you're between the ages of 19 and 64 in the state of Alabama, we expect you to have a job. And if you don't have a job, probably not going to have health insurance unless you can make a couple of exceptions. One, you get it through your, your parent, and that only works till you're 26, and that happened through the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, depending on which of the people in the video you, you side with. Um, and the other piece is through your, through your spouse. And if you aren't one of those people, you don't have health insurance. Um, so that's what we're talking about, that, that 15%, that 15% uh, which is actually 16% of the state of Alabama. Um, so this is the government form of insurance. Uh, this is private insurance. And then that's the uninsured population. So we're talking about the blue piece of the pie here. Um, so w the cost of un the uninsured, and this is an older statistic. So uh, forgive me for, for being dated here. Nonetheless, it's a big number, right? $73 trillion. That wasn't, Bernie Sanders didn't calculate that statistic. I, that's important to note. That wasn't a curated statistic for political reason. That, was cur that statistic came from an accounting firm. $73 trillion the cost of the system. Closer to home, how many of you know what UAB gave last year in uncompensated care? Anybody take a guess? 
how much money that UAB provided to citizens who didn't have health insurance who came to our hospital? Not quite, million? million? Yeah, billion would be real high. Uh, but that would be like half our budget. Uh, Heart palpitations. Ten million. More than 10. A little higher. $144 million. $144 million. It's uncompensated care, so it's basically you're, written it off, you're, you're writing it off because the person is not going to have the ability to pay, right? So that number is part of that chunk, but there's a whole lot else that's, that's bound up in that 73 trillion th figure. It's a big problem. It's a big problem for our balance sheet as a state, as a city, as a country, as a public hospital. So this is a big, this is a big piece of it, and this is something that I was really passionate about. And then this other, this other piece, one half of personal bankruptcies, right? So what we found out was that 73% of personal bankruptcies in the state of Alabama came from uh, uh, some type of medical cost. And that year, there were 123,000 people, 123, people who went bankrupt that year. So that means, and I said this a lot when I was in Tuscaloosa, if I went to Tuscaloosa and filled up Bryant-Denny Stadium, I could fill that up with all the people in this state in one year who had gone bankrupt because of medical cost. I could fill up the entire stadium. That's a big number. But what does it do to those people? Right? Because at the end of the day, those are real stories. They have life and vitality and families and dreams and hopes just like you and me. And we dash them when we, 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 we tell them they don't belong. We make medical bankruptcy a legitimate reality and persistent threat and fear for so many people. So um, we, we cost a lot of money in the US. Uh, so, um, which one's the outlier? All right. <laughs> um, so this is us down here. Um, the United States spends about seven thousand five hundred ninety-eight dollars uh, per individual in healthcare. Um, I can tell you where those costs come from. Most of them go to what's called dual um, dual eligible population between Medicare and Medicaid folks. Many have chronic illnesses um, that are difficult to manage, and that's where most of the money goes. In fact, what we know is that uh, about ten percent of the sickest population, 10% of the actual po health population, is really can attribute about 50% of the cost. So we're taking care of a lot of people on the back end of their lives when they're really sick, we're not doing such a good job on the front end of their lives. And so what the UK has done, right, and I can speak most clearly to the UK because I live there, they've said like, you know, actually we're going to take you on the front end. So for example, um, uh, when I was playing rugby, I played rugby over there, um, my, last, my last rugby game, um, I was old, still am, but it was, at the time I played and I, I hit my eye right here. And I walked in with stitches. I was wearing my rugby uniform um, and thankfully my wife had signed me up to the NHS. I go in, I'm wearing my rugby uniform. All I do is put my name down. They stitch me up, um, but they don't just stitch me up, right? They asked me a series of questions, which I now know to be a behavioral health assessment, which was, you know, essentially what they were asking was like, look, man, you don't need to be playing rugby anymore. You know, you need to grow up. But they didn't say that. They were, they were merciful. What they really said was, what happened? And I was like, I'm literally in my rugby uniform, you know, blood on my jersey. And um, they said, essentially, you know what? Um, what happened? And I said, well, I'm in my rugby uniform. Like, clearly this happened. And they said, well, we've seen people get in bar fights and put on a rugby uniform. Right, why? Why were they asking me those questions? Because they wanted to see if there was some underlying behavioral issue that might cause me to be in there again. It's preventative for them and for me, right? And so I now know that that's what, how a lot of people think about healthcare, is let's attack this on the front end, let's shift these costs, not on the back end where we're taking people, care of people when they're already sick, and these social determinants have, have occupied mo most of their life, let's talk about it on the front end. Again, that is, that is employment for us, right? Um, so I'm gonna really rush through these stats um, because I wanna get back to what we do. So. Um, this is, this is uh, outcome disparities. The average life expectancy in the U.S. differs by as much as 30 years between rich countries and poor, uh, rich counties and poor counties. Um, we actually have a pretty low, comparatively low life expectancy as a result of that. That's the mean dragging us down, right? Because in the richest counties, we're doing just fine. In fact, we, we're better than the number one countries. So um, here's, here, here's the bottom line. I've kind of beat that point down, so I'm just going to keep going. So why Innovate Birmingham? Innovate Birmingham is a recognition of what 
social determinants do? There's a, 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 a North Carolina Journal of Medicine article that came out just a month ago, I think, that said 80% of healthcare outcomes are attributed to social determinants of health. It goes right along with what y'all are doing here. 80%. A big piece of that is access. And so what we wanted to do was say, you know what, all the people who come through here, they're going to get they're going to get training for a job. They're going to get um, financial literacy. We're going to give wraparound services to make sure they have transportation and child care taken care of. And then we're going to give them the best shot they can at, at getting a credential and then getting a foothold in the labor market. And when they do that, that gives them traction on this health outcome metric. People always ask, why does Birmingham do this, right? I work for Dr. Watts. For those of you who don't know, I work for President Watts. And people always used to ask me, like, why are y'all doing this? And I said, at the time, I just, I, I, I wanted to go, you know how much we just paid in, in uncompensated care, right? So where is it smart for us to invest? Now, that's just, the, that's just the economic side. Is it smart for us to keep investing in people who come, show up in the ER and don't have health insurance, but they're showing up with a cough? Or is it smart for us to invest in the front end and say, actually, not only can we be, uh, 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 the, the gateway to the, our university doesn't have to be through the emergency room. It can be through a, a series of programs that offer people the opportunity to learn, grow, and excel in a labor market. So that's the economic side. The other part, and I, I say this all the time, is the moral side. This is our community. This is your community. And so when we think about it, we have to create those opportunities for people. Many of us had them. We didn't have to go fight for them. A lot of the students that come through our program are what's called stopouts. In fact, two, or three, two out of three of them are. They started college somewhere. They had the aptitude, but they, for whatever reason, couldn't finish. One of our students had cancer. One of our students had a mom that got sick. One of them had a child. Time and time again, they, they tell us stuff that matter. That it matters. It's a life-altering decision that keeps them away. And oh, by the way, the debt keeps piling up. So what we wanted to do was, was give a cost-free, tuition-free option to students to get um, workforce skills that, that trains them and gives them the opportunity to move forward in the labor market. So that's Innovate Birmingham, <coughs> in a nutshell. We um, uh, basically, I'll, I'll just, the big fact is we got a $6 million from the U.S. Department of Labor to implement this program. So we were one of 23 communities selected nationwide as an America's Promise community. And our promise, not just to America, but to our, the folks in Birmingham, is that we will Throw, we will do everything we can to get young people to and through employment. So here, what was the, what was the, um, the premise? Uh, so as you look at these, I want you to think about this fact. 15 community organizations signed on to this. UAB is just the lead on it. But 30 employers signed on to this. So these are private sector folks. Sometimes we like to keep, well, sometimes in America, we like to make those people mutually exclusive. We like to say that, Nonprofits are over here, employers are over here, education institutions are somewhere in between, and they all really don't get along. Let me tell you, in my experience, that's not true because all of them have the same stake in the game. We each serve this local community, and if this local community is suffering, we all suffer. So here's the deal. We had a supply that was big, a, a labor supply, right? Birmingham is home to 26,000 young people between the ages of 17 and 29 who are underemployed or unemployed. That's the 16th largest population in the country as a percentage of our population. But there, then there was this op opportunity, right? So if that's the problem, here's the opportunity. The opportunity is here. As a tech hire city, Birmingham posted 5,300 IT jobs in a single year on top of a denominator about 14,600, which gives us this 37.2% in demand, and that gives us the second fastest IT job growth in the country. Now, is that all super advanced IT jobs? No, right? It's the person who you call at UAB when you have a help desk issue, right? When you forget your password. I don't know, password resets are about 60% of help desk issues. <laughs> Y'all need to write down your passwords, right? Actually don't, because it keeps our people employed. But here's, here's, the, here's the deal. Two of the people who work on UAB's help desk came through our program. I'm gonna tell you one of their stories right now. I'm not gonna say his name, but he was a UAB student. Came through UAB. As a junior, he decided he couldn't do it all. He had to stop out. Stops out in December. Comes to our program in February. February 13th, he starts class. May 5th, he graduates. May 8th, he starts at UAB, making $22 an hour. This fall, he's in class, back in class. That, that's a transition. Oh, and by the way, he's health insurance. Another one of our students had cancer, didn't have health insurance, was in college, dropped out. Had to fight the battle to get cancer, get screening, get taken care of, 
Now he's working at the largest employer in the state of Alabama, or the largest insurance provider of the state of Alabama, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Guess what? He has health insurance. So next time he starts feeling a cough, he doesn't have to worry about whether or not leukemia is going back. He can go and get it tested, right? That's a big difference, not just in the way that he lives, the way he paid, but in the way he thinks, the way he conceives of himself, and he tells us that. Um, so what's the solution for us? Talent is distributed equally in our community, but opportunity is not. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that every single one of our neighborhoods, none of them have a, a monopoly on good ideas or talented people or people capable of, of changing the world, but so, so very often we don't give everybody the same opportunity. So what we're trying to do with Innovate Birmingham is give a host of young people, particularly 1,000 out of that 26,000, the opportunity to, to reskill and, and get skilled up for new uh, employment positions. So this is a kind of our strategy. Um, really, I don't need to go into it too long, but basically this is the spectrum of how we connect all of this um, together. We start with industry demand. We start with people with what people need, right? Because we don't want to start preparing a bunch of students to go out into the labor force and then they say, ah, uh, we don't need those skills anymore, right? So we stay on top of that. We do that through a program called the Birmingham Tech Council that Serena runs. We map our skills with our curriculum. We test for motivation. Even when you apply to our program, you got about a one in seven shot of getting in, not because we don't think you're talented or your, your, your aptitude is low, but because we want the most students with who are most motivated to be in our program. Um, and we often say, if you say to us, I'm here because my grandmother asked me to be, probably not going to cut it. You need to, tell, you need to tell us why you want to be an IT professional. Um, and then we, we have a couple of different layers. We have boot camps, uh, two-year colleges, and four-year college scholarships, all to kind of meet people where they are along the this, this spectrum. So here's our partners. Again, these are the 15 folks who helped us secure the grant. Um, and then uh, this is what we call the Education Employer Alliance. This is the Birmingham Tech Council. The idea is to shorten and tighten the feedback loop between educational institutions and, um, and employers, right? In 2014, the White House wrote a jobs report that said the problem is you've got educators on one, one highway, students on another highway, and um, employers on another. And these three parallel highways never intersect. So what we wanted to do is build a super highway that flooded the zone of opportunity for people to give them access to new education, coaching, mentoring, and that gave them uh, an opportunity to get, to get skilled up. Um, and so th this, is really, this is really it. This is kind of how it all, this is the nuts and bolts. So outreach and recruitment, really we, we rely on a lot of people to, to help us with this, word of mouth. Um, I hope some of you will tell your friends, your family about this program because I do think it matters. Um, then we help people define which pathway works best for them. Uh, they go through our program, enroll, um, and then the idea is that we get them jobs. Uh, we've had pretty good numbers so far, and I'll talk about those in a second. But here's, here's our two programs. We have boot camps. Um, IMBHAM is a program that's, that's powered by Covalence, which, is, not, which is, a, is a company here in town that teaches people front-end web development. We have a front-end full-stack web development class. Generation is a program by McKinsey Social Initiative. Uh, it's the nonprofit arm of McKinsey and Company, for those of you who are familiar. Um, they rolled this out in several different cities, but, but Birmingham was their fifth. It teaches people how to become help desk support specialists. When we wrote this, there were 296 positions open in Birmingham at that time for help desk support. And at the time, no one was teaching people how to become help desk support specialists which as, as you know, probably involves some interactive curriculum, right? It can't just all be done online. You have to actually work with the machinery, the physical machinery of the computer. We also work with two-year colleges. Jeff State is the biggest feeder into the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, they have different campuses. We work with them uh, to give scholarships to students. So we, 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 um, this is a first dollar basis scholarship, so it actually goes in before your Pell Grant. So that could then free people up to get books and tuition. Same thing at Lawson State. And then at UAB, what I love about this is that uh, my boss, Dr. Watts, decided he was not, he was going to match the grant. So let's say you get full Pell Grant. That's $5,200. That's great. But that only gets you about halfway to tuition. So what we do is we supplement that with about $2,500 of tuition with the grant funding. And then UAB Central, Dr. Watts' office, matches that with another $2,500. That's $10,200, which takes care of your tuition. So we've got people who can go all the way through for free, which is pretty remarkable. And obviously, all these occupations are what, what these skills are aligned to, and they're, they're high demand. So these are all s directly aligned to nine high demand skills. Um, so what are we trying to do? This is it. We want 150 IMBHAM graduates by 2020. 
Uh, we want 300 generation graduates by 2020, 252 year college graduates, and 274 year college graduates. And the bottom line is this, when we wrote the grant, we looked at people and said, hey, we're gonna have to change programs by the time that we're done, because that's how quickly technology is changing. So this also helps us be a little more agile, more responsive, so we're gonna build on, layer on a cybersecurity course that'll be coming online very soon. Uh, since we wrote that, the DNC was hacked, Yahoo was hacked, Equifax was hacked, uh, Yahoo was hacked. Um, so everybody's talking about hacking these days, and so we wanna to, to think through how we can, how we can give cybersecurity entry-level boot camp skills to, to folks that they have a better shot at the labor market. So why we do this, this is a picture of our first class. 85% um, graduation rate and 77% had jobs within a week, or a couple weeks, um, three weeks. And uh, so right now that's, that's, that, that number is holding them pretty steady. Most of these programs look at placement rates at six months. Uh, so we're, we're not even at six months yet um, from graduation. So we don't, we're not quite there, but the Department of Labor is really thrilled with our performance so far. Um, and again, what happens when these guys get jobs? They're hired at Protective. They're hired at uh, Alabama Power, Regions Bank. Um, one of the Regions Bank, one of our first, he's making $65,000 a year as a, as a web developer, and three months ago he was unemployed. Um, so why are we doing this? Again, it's, and then we're not just leaving people. We're telling them, hey, look, go and sign up for your health plan. Go see a doctor. Go find out what a PCP means, right? And go get a primary health care physician and how and, and think through how you can um, improve yourself, uh, improve your community as a result of it.